Ninja 3 The Domination isn't a badly made film. It's in focus, you can hear what people are saying, and it even has a beginning, middle and end. Thing is, they're from three different movies. It's true. That may be why we love it, but it doesn't make much sense. So to find out how such a thing came to be, I spoke to some of those responsible and came across a tale of archaic chauvinism, bizarre decisions, and reassuringly happy filmmakers, albeit with an unhappy ninja among them. Ninja 3, the domination. I heard ninja. I want to know what the hell that is. <laughs> Enter the Ninja, the first film in Canon's influential trilogy, grew out of Eric Van Luspader's 1980 novel simply titled The Ninja, which was read and adored by Hawaiian karate champion Mike Stone, who involved himself in an ultimately doomed film adaptation. When the project fell through, Stone developed his own idea based on similar characters, and in 1980 sold it to Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus at Canon Films who reconfigured his screenplay as Enter the Ninja and installed the surprised martial artist in the lead role. Briefly. At the last moment, Cannon replaced Stone with Franco Nero for fairly predictable reasons. He's a great athlete, but he cannot act. The legendary Italian would play Texan ninja Cole, despite speaking no English and knowing no martial art. He is no ninja, compai. Stone remained to tweak the questionable screenplay and choreograph the fights, but his most important contribution was bringing the unknown Shokasugi on board, first as a stuntman, but ultimately as Cole's antagonist, Hasegawa. Introducing Shokasugi. Originally, Cannon wanted Tadashi Yamashita, who just played the villain opposite Chuck Norris in the octagon, but he deemed the part too small and declined at the 11th hour. Sign up. According to Kasugi, producer-director Menachem Golan then saw the former All Japan Karate Champion showing off on set and offered him the part. Presumably Golan missed him in the Bad News Bears Go to Japan. <laughs> Don't worry. Enter the Ninja proved a hit, making over $30 million at the box office and laying the foundations for the 1980s ninja boom. Our power could grow tremendously. Yes, I've waited long enough for this. So when Golan announced a sequel, it surprised nobody. The unrelated Revenge of the Ninja sees Kasugi in his first lead role as Cho, a ninja master who moves to the US to run an art gallery after his family is massacred in Japan. Free from the romantic and melodramatic distractions that afflict the first film, and with Franco Nero expunged from the cast, Revenge of the Ninja is a more focused and effective action movie than its predecessor. Again it made good money and again Canon retraced their steps to the ninja wellspring. But Golan was concerned the concept was getting tired and demanded new angles be found. These are necessary in case the spirit becomes angry. The returning creative team of director Sam Furstenberg and writer James Silk brainstormed numerous ideas, but we have the movie gods to thank for the ones that stuck. Adrian Lyne's flash dance and Toby Hooper's Poltergeist Where was the last incident in the bar location? would provide the inspiration for a new take on ninja mythology. Flashdance was the hit of the moment as Ninja 3 was being conceived and its female protagonist convinced Golan that a woman could be both sexy and tough, which apparently hadn't occurred to anyone at Canon before. He informed Furstenberg and Silk that their movie's lead character was now a woman, and they got to work developing Christy Ryder with Jennifer Beale's dancing welder as the prototype. That's why the two women look alike, why they both balance traditionally male jobs with traditionally female passions that allow for lycra. Both occupy a quirky old warehouse in an industrial wasteland and so on. The poltergeist influence is really more of an exorcist influence. All at Canon seem to have conflated the two movies because while elements of Ninja 3 bear a visual resemblance to the former, Hello? the possession angle that's key to everything was obviously derived from the latter. Originally they even had a spinning head in this scene. The idea of a male possessing the female lead resulted from a dispute with Shokasugi, who as technical advisor on all things ninja was adamant that women were too weak and silly to fight men. <coughs> Apparently he was less concerned with the plot revolving around a supernatural ninja assassin avenging his own death through an aerobic instructing telephone engineer. No harm in that. Casting Christie was key. 
for the fight seems to be manageable and believable, and the like were justifiable, Furstenberg wanted an actress with background in some kind of corporeal discipline, if not a martial art, then at least dance or gymnastics. And of course she had to be attractive. I like your pajamas. Heather Locklear was making a name for herself on Dynasty, often in Lycra, and fitted the bill perfectly, but she turned the role down. No. Good. Everyone's second choice was Lucinda Dickey, a trained dancer who caught the acting bug after working as a glorified extra on Grease 2. Gross! At least Ninja 3 wasn't her worst movie. <laughs> Dickey's fitness and strength appealed to Furstenberg, and after auditioning for he and Menachem Golan, she was offered the part. In fact, the audition also won her the leading Canon's hip-hop gravy train jumper, Breakin, which was shot after but released prior to Ninja 3 its mystifying popularity ensuring Dickie a profile of sorts. I mean, this could be a really big break for us. I don't care! Jordan Bennett signed on as Billy Secord, Christie's hairy love interest and one of the cops the Black Ninja's spirit is determined to murder. It was his first feature, but prior acting gigs included a fair bit of stage work, a few lines on the Waltons... Happy Fourth of July, Ben. Same to you, Norm. ...and Angry Terrorist in an episode of BJ and the Bear. You talk. When I tell you, you can talk. Korean-born schoolteacher David Chang was cast as the Black Ninja thanks to his karate and rock climbing skills, although much of the role was performed by stand-ins and he actually wore green. That left Shokasugi, the nominal star, to play Yamada, a good ninja who travels from Japan to take down the green Black Ninja, with whom he has previous beef. <laughs> The problem, from Kasugi's point of view, was the size of the part. Yamada doesn't show up until the second act, has very little dialogue, and didn't even defeat the Green Black Ninja in the finale. Originally Christie had the honour, something Kasugi wasn't happy about. Only a ninja can destroy a ninja. And here were sown the seeds of chaos that flowered during the final days of filming. No kidding. Copy, 451 at the golf course. Let's go. In October 1983, cast and crew headed to Phoenix, Arizona, where Cannon had negotiated favourable terms with the municipal government, and filming began with scenes inside a working police station. Some of these people are real cops, and some aren't. It all went quite smoothly, at least to begin with. Dickie and Bennett got on like a house on fire, and everyone loved working with Furstenberg, particularly stunt coordinator Steve Lambert, who had the most fun of his career shooting the infamous opening action scene in which the Black Ninja takes out 24 cops, four security guards, two civilians and a helicopter. It took two units a week to shoot the sequence at the now peaceful Papago Golf Club east of Phoenix, where in addition to David Chang at least five performers donned the Black Ninja's green suit, including Lambert, who did so much stand-in work he probably has more screen time than Kasugi. There was a fall specialist for this shot, a gymnast for this one, and both Kasugi and his assistant, Alan Emil, who doubled for Chang in pickups for the scene's frenzied conclusion. By the way, this guy. A man who can spend eight minutes shooting at a supernatural ninja without it once dislodging the cigar from the corner of his mouth is clearly a man to be reckoned with. Other key locations include Christie's apartment, which is actually a set built atop an elaborate spring mechanism allowing it to roll and shake, this was to accurately reflect the structural impact of a demonic possession. I don't believe in demons, ghosts, spirits, or any of that kind of stuff. Glendale Memorial Park was home to the second big action scene of the movie, and the second motorcycle fall for Evil Knievel's stuntman's son, Robbie, while the climactic fight was shot on a soundstage in Midtown Phoenix. Only it wasn't. Ah! I said earlier that production was straightforward to begin with. Is it true that only a ninja can destroy a ninja? As the otherwise happy shoot progressed, Kasugi became increasingly vexed about not being the lead, particularly because he was replaced by a woman. Immediately prior to shooting his final scene, which was set in a remote ninja temple and featured Yamada playing second fiddle as Christie saved the day by herself, Kasugi stormed off set, refusing to have anything further to do with filming. A call was put into home base and the decision made to return to LA without an ending in the hope that editors could find a solution. Yeah, okay. Unsurprisingly, they couldn't. And Kasugi was still refusing to film the scene. He would, it transpired, agree to shoot a different scene, one in which Christie was relegated to spectator and Yamada dealt the fatal blow to the Black Ninja himself. <laughs> 
Discussion with the Go-Go Boys was brief. Kasugi was the headline star of the movie, they needed him. Furstenberg and Silk came up with an idea he accepted, and an additional week of production was scheduled in order to shoot a climactic battle between Yamada and the Black Ninja. With no money to return to Arizona, a spot in California's Simi Valley was deemed similar enough to pass for the rocky scrubland already established as the Ninja Temple's setting. Cast and crew were reconvened, but by this point Dickie had cut her hair short and begun work on break-in, where she was also undermined by a male co-star more expert than her in the discipline of the day. Lucinda Dickey didn't really fit in the breaking film. He made it known from the very first day that I walked into rehearsals that he was superior. So she was fitted with a wig for what amounts to a handful of awkward reaction shots. Happy to be the leading man in his own mini-movie, Kasugi was the consummate professional. Post-production proved unremarkable if reasonably lengthy due to the unusual number of visual effects for a ninja movie. Trivia fans might be interested to know the map painting of the Ninja Temple was the work of Jim Danforth, who'd recently inked the Earth for the opening shot of John Carpenter's The Thing. In this behind-the-scenes shot, you can see that the doorway into the temple was the only part of the structure actually built. The rest is Danforth's mat, which was flipped for the two angles. What is this, anyway? <laughs> Ultimately, none of these late-in-the-day efforts could save Ninja 3, and it opened to hostile reviews and audience indifference in September 1984, its dismal box office performance killing the franchise stone dead. But nearly four decades later, it's a fan favourite, and getting more popular year by year. You cannot stop me! I am a ninja! Ninja 3 may be enjoyed ironically, but it's more a film of contrasts than calamities. The combination of ideas is ridiculous, but the plot gets us from A to B to C just fine. The action scenes can be daft, but they're well staged with skilled performers. Christie's domination makes no sense, but Dickie's acting is good enough to sell things like this. I don't have any coffee in my apartment, but I do have some veggies. Would you like to take me home? It looks good, Kasugi's great, and there's a sure hand at the tiller which makes it accessible to nostalgic genre fans and bad movie connoisseurs. At the same time, many elements that drew criticism on release demand praise today. The effects, which were panned but looked fantastic compared to the CG soup of modern equivalents. The fight scenes, which were considered uninspired by critics, but I'll always take Shokasugi roundhousing over an epilepsy-triggering blizzard of Liam Neeson's lumbering. And of course, the problem of a woman not being able to fight a man. That said, Ninja 3 obviously has issues. Many are common to any movie. Sometimes the sound guy is going to drop his sunglasses in shot without anybody noticing. And of course, there's all the excess and cheese. But some of the best examples relate to tone. This scene takes place immediately after the opening golf course ninja thorn and possession sequence, and sees Christie interviewed in the local police station. Look at how the perpetually horny Seacord eyes up his quarry, who's busy giving an official statement about her harrowing experience, and how he moves in for the kill, egged on by his buddy, like some teen jock slipping the prom queen a roofie. Give her a break, Lieutenant. Alright? I wouldn't drink that if I were you. All this is odd enough even before we consider the timing. It's only a few minutes since Secord witnessed dozens of his colleagues horribly killed in an orgy of metaphysical murder. It's not appropriate to be on the pull. Alright? Elements like this are your good, bad bread and butter in Ninja 3, and Secord's responsible for a lot of them. I heard Ninja. I want to know what the hell that is. Another favourite is the way he stalks Christy to her aerobics class, despite her telling him not to, then ignores the violent muggers outside and arrests her for saving their victim. I assume he's meant to be offbeat charming, but he comes off more like a sex pest. Hey, look, would you just lay off a cloudy? It's just not in the cards, all right? Would you stop the car? Now get this straight. I don't go out with cops, all right? How about some coffee? No. Stop the car! How about some coffee? You know, coffee's really bad for your health. As for how and why these curious decisions were made, look no further than the management at Canon. Born and raised in Israel, Menachem Golan was the company's creative powerhouse. 
but a romanticized vision of his role meant he wasn't always as connected to audiences as he may have felt. We are like those troubadours in the Middle Ages who used to go to the marketplaces and tell fairy tales, tell story to the people who had dreary lives. What's more, and in common with the men behind a surprising proportion of today's most celebrated good-bad treasures, he was a non-American making American product for Americans. That isn't a prescription for disaster. Filmmakers for whom English is a second language have been responsible for half of Hollywood's greatest achievements. But there's no denying that, like others, Golan didn't always recognize the tonal and thematic conventions audiences were conditioned to. An abortion is being played with U2 music under it. And you go from a doctor performing an abortion to some guy cutting a pizza. Furstenberg was also born and began his career in Israel, making Hebrew language films for a largely domestic audience. And while the two men often got it right, Ninja 3 is a perfect example of Canon's tonal and thematic blind spots. Rough day, huh? It's over now. After Ninja 3 and the break-in movies, Dickey decided against pursuing a career as an in-house canon starlet. Before retiring to raise her children, she appeared in only one further movie, run-of-the-mill 1988 slasher cheerleader camp. Our loss, her gain. Damn it! This is impossible! Jordan Bennett went on to appear in numerous major stage productions, playing the lead in Cyrano de Bergerac on Broadway and in Le Miserable in Los Angeles. Full of surprises, aren't you? You can hear him on cast recordings, and he's released several solo albums. And she's buying a stairway to heaven. Today, he's returned to his roots as a comedian and singer, despite a rough start. Milton Berle disconnects my microphone and escorts me off stage to thunderous applause. In addition to a one-man show, he regularly performs a comedic musical review with Star Trek alumni and best friend Robert Picardo. The LA Times called it brilliant. I am going to sing the hard part, the high part, the part you had to squeeze your holographic nuts to squeak out. By the time Ninja 3 was released, Sho Kasugi was appearing opposite Lee Van Cleef in The Master, the NBC TV series that gave him a mainstream profile. It was short-lived and he made surprisingly few films afterwards, his best role probably being patriarchal secret ninja Akira Saito in Pray for Death. Do ninjas still exist? Ninjas? No, of course not. Infinitely sillier is Nine Deaths of the Ninja. In this extraordinary sub-megaforce Bondian kitsch fest, Kasugi plays Lollipop. I want a clean girl, no clap. The leader of an improbable military super team who must deal with killer dwarves. <laughs> Tennis pro VJ Armitage for some reason. What? A hijack? And one of the funniest villains you'll ever come across. Rest and rehabilitation aboard Madam Whoopi's floating boat palace. Actually make that two of the funniest villains you'll ever come across. I am Colonel Honey Hump. And you, my dear, are my prisoners. In the years since, he's made numerous TV appearances in his native Japan, opened a chain of martial arts acting schools, started a taiko drumming group, created a ninja-themed stage show, become a prolific author, and released dozens of instructional videos. He made a welcome return to the big screen in 2009's Wachowski-produced Ninja Assassin. Director James McTeague said none of the new generation could compare to Kasugi. Most children are disappointments, not worth the effort to raise. Sam Furstenberg went on to direct a slew of genre classics for canon, including American Ninja and the underrated Avenging Force. My God! This here is my sister. If she dies, I'll hold everyone in this room personally responsible. When Cannon collapsed, he hooked up with former honchos Avi Lerner and Boaz Davidson at Millennium Films, continuing Cannon's original cheap and cheerful genre philosophy with movies like Operation Delta Force and Cyborg Cop. He's not dead, you brainless syphilitic idiot! Having contributed to a fascinating look back at his career entitled Stories from the Trenches, today Sam's happily retired in suburban Los Angeles. 
but I get the feeling you could be tempted back to those trenches if the right project came along. The movement for Ninja 4 starts here. <laughs> 